thank you so much. Oh, I am so happy to be here. Welcome everyone to the secret block, which is now revealed to be Super Smash Bros. Melee. I'm here with some wonderful people. I will introduce them in their order of appearance. Uh, first, myself, I'm Onosaurus. I'm the organizer of this particular block, as well as the creator of the TASTM32, which is the replay device used by this and many other runs. Uh, next up in the order of appearance is Rasteri. He has been my partner in crime for the last few months. He is another coder of the TASTM32. Say hello, Rasteri. Hello, Rasteri. <laughs> Next up in order of appearance is King Curb 64. You may know him uh, for his work on the Smash Ultimate Quarantine Matchup Chart, which analyzed data from Smash.gg to create some statistics. He was the idea man who pushed us. He pushed this project from being lingering for a year and a half to making sure it got done. Say hello, King Curb 64. Hey, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the stream. I'm sure they are. And Practical Tass is last but not least. He is a popular Smash YouTuber. He is the author of almost all of the Tasses you will see today. There are one or two exceptions. Say hello, Practical Tass. Hello, everyone. Excellent. So, um, one of those exceptions uh, is going to be playing in the background right now uh, while, uh, while we explain the beginning of uh, what's going on. So, uh, what, what's playing in the background is made by Rastery while we explain. So, Super Smash Bros. Melee, it will be the first vanilla, unmodified, disc-based system where a task has been console verified. Now, uh, in a couple GDQs ago, F-Zero GX and Super Monkey Ball were also done. However, they were using replay files rather than going through the controller port. Actually, F-Zero GX did have some inputs coming through the controller port, but that did not sync. So this is super hype that we're able to make this happen. We had to overcome a lot of issues to make this happen, so we're going to go through those issues as we uh, go through the various runs. So, the first and probably most obvious issue that we had to overcome is how do we get it to sync on a disk-based system? Disks take a variable amount of time to speed up. There's heat, there's friction, there could be a piece of dust that causes it to skip and have to go around and read again. There are so many variable physical factors that we had to find a way to make this sync. So um, Rasteri is gonna go ahead and explain the first two things we tried, which unfortunately didn't work out. Take it away, Rasteri. Thank you, Yona. So the first thing we tried was to give the Taz ears, so to speak. Um, at the start of each level in Melee, the announcer says, ready, go, really loudly. So we tried setting up the Taz to start it after it hears that sound. Um, we managed to get it triggering very reliably, but unfortunately the audio library used in Melee is completely decoupled from the game logic, so that didn't provide enough precision. Um, so the next thing we tried was to give the Taz eyes. Um, we built a little circuit to measure the brightness of the composite video signal and wrote code to trigger on a graphical scene change. Again, we got this triggering really reliably, but unfortunately there's a variable amount of lag in the video signal. Um, it might have been possible to predict this lag, but the problem was looking pretty intractable. Um, luckily, though, KingCurb64 had an even better idea that he'll explain now, so take it away, KingCurb64. Well, since audio and video were bust, we would need some other way to cue when to start from the console. But as it turns out, there's one thing that we can use to sync perfectly, which is rumble. You see, when a character spawns, um, some of them will fall down to the ground and send a short rumble signal to the controller. Using that rumble as a cue, we can sync to the game's engine. Uh, let's walk you through the first of the event. I want to solve it. Can you please uh, begin the task? We are gonna be and I have the memory card in. We're going to be showing off a Break the Targets run made by Practical Tasks. This is going to verify that our inputs are synced in time with the game's engine. If we were using audio or video, we would still be off by a few frames if it ran at all, but this one will always finish at 6.58 seconds. Uh, while we wait for the character to bust these targets, here are a few fun facts about this run. This is actually a new world record for Break the Targets for Pikachu, breaking the old world record of 6.68 seconds. 
This one also used the same strategy as the real-time route, which was discovered by Demon 9, a Legend of Zelda speedrunner, and whose records currently held by Sawtooth 1. In fact, out of all the routes, that real-time route is actually the fastest, as is running the same way a human would, only with superhuman precision. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see a funny yellow rat break the targets now. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Alrighty, awesome. And that is the current Pikachu world record of 6.58 seconds. I'd just like to take a minute to say this is the NTSC 1.00 version of the game. But I think we've also seen this particular run sync in Palin 1.02. So awesome. We have indeed, so that's yeah. super cool. We have this syncing. But, you know, this is a pretty short run. It's less than eight seconds. And see, Melee has an issue of pulling drift. Uh, due to a uh, clock drift between a 60 hertz alarm set in the game and a 59.94 hertz rate of the NTSC video standard, there's an issue. So the GameCube will pull the controller twice per frame, but Melee only reads one of those, usually. It starts off by reading the second one per frame, then it goes back to the first one per frame, then it goes back to the second, and that alternation occurs about every 8.3 seconds. Uh, essentially what's happening is there are 200 input poles for 1,001 video frames instead of for 1,000 video frames. And if made, uh, sorry, uh, 2,000 poles for 1,001 video frames. Sorry if I misspoke. Um, and that's great. If the game loaded in the same time each time, we could adjust the task inputs accordingly. But again, because of the variable disk reads, we don't know when it's going to switch ahead of time because it may have taken longer or shorter to load. So uh, we started coming up with an algorithm. Uh, I made a version that worked pretty well, but Rastery took it and perfected it. Uh, or at least we thought. We really needed something, some longer run to test um, to test and prove that we can stay in sync for a long period of time. So we reached out to our friend Practical Tasks and we put our heads together and I asked him, what do you think would be a really fun thing to show? A nice run longer than eight seconds, maybe even longer than a minute, that would show some typical Practical task swag. Take it away and tell him uh, what our solution is. Yeah, as Onosaurus said, is more of a stress test. We wanted to show off a longer test, one that definitely passes validation in spite of pulling drift. We still had a few restrictions. We can't control CPUs, so that eliminates most of the single player modes. We also wanted something dynamic to make sure that we only sync if we're frame perfect. Lastly, we wanted something that worked in fixed camera mode so the camera isn't swinging wildly around and making anybody motion sick. Luckily for us, there is precisely one stage that fits the bill, and that is Poke Floats. Pokefloats is a fun stage. It runs in fixed camera mode by default, has completely deterministic movement, and is exciting enough that it provides a lot of entertainment value. As you will soon see, it is also completely busted. We're going to play as Fox, naturally, and change the timer to 4 minutes to give us enough time to run a full loop of the stage. We're also going to trigger the name entry glitch, which is done by holding B in the name entry box and pressing A frame perfectly. Holding B should return us to the menu, Pressing A should send us to the enter a tag screen, but if you do both of those things at the same time, the game does neither of those things, and instead, it lets us play a multiplayer match with only one character. So you're gonna see that just after we switch the timer. Right here. Right off the bat, there's going to be a lot of extra inputs that you don't see, done in a way where we desync instantly if we don't act exactly on the first frame possible, so we've confirmed that we've synced. We're going to hop over to Onyx, and the first thing most people learn when playing on Pokefloats is that you can't fall through Onyx, but you can jump up from underneath him. This is because unlike most floats, he only consists of a floor, not a ceiling, and floors, ceilings, and walls in Melee are all one way. Combine this fact with the fact that a lot of the floats spawn off-screen but inbounds, and if we, for instance, get inside where Psyduck is about to spawn, we can hang around inside him and fire Fox back up once he's completely visible. Something else you need to know about Melee is that there's a bit of an oversight in its collision detection, which means that if a floor and a wall meet at an obtuse angle, i.e. greater than 90 degrees, you can probably find a way to clip through it, as I helpfully demonstrate twice here with Chikorita. Next, we're going to perform some wall jumps before landing on Psyduck. We're going to go off screen again, fall off Psyduck, and reappear from inside Slowpoke, who also loads inbounds. 
We're then going to jump over to Weezing and do a few more wall jumps, then a couple reverse wall jumps, which are a fun glitch that I don't have time to explain. Here's one, and if you missed it, here's another. And just for good measure, Slowpoke's face also is a wall and an obtuse angle to his nose, so we're going to clip inside there too. Next we're going to hang out for a second on Weezing, because Weezing does the reverse of most floats and despawns inbounds, so it's safe to stand on him until he despawns. We're next going to boost run over to the Porygons, Invisible Shine, and jump around on them. After Wooper, who's coming up next, is Pseudo Wudo, who spawns barely inbounds, so we can kind of clip under his head twig with good timing. Those balls do not have any collision, but they do hide real platforms that we can run around on. When we go over Pseudo Wudo's head, we actually do go out of bounds briefly, but in Smash you can jump past the top blast zone as long as you get back below it by the time you land. Tsuruto's other arm is also present on his model off screen, but it has no collision so we can just fall right through it. We're going to invisible shine off Wooper, and would you look at that, Snorlax also has an obtuse wall and floor, so we're going to clip into him and then come back up and tell Venusaur to come on. After that, we're going to sticky walk around on Venusaur for a bit before performing some absurdly fast shield drops, some wave lands, an edge cancel and wave dash around on Venusaur's leaves, then make our way over to Seal. There's a blink and you'll miss a clip through doing an up aerial attack before we find another clip into Seal. This one is very easy to do and happened to many an unsuspecting smasher back when Poke Floats was legal in competitive play. Buffett also spawns inbounds, twice actually, so we're gonna get inside him when he spawns, then hang out with Goldeen as she bounces around. We can multi-shine very fast on her as long as she's moving upwards, but while she falls we have to wait until we catch up with her. The last 45 seconds or so of Poke Floats loop features a lot of unknown, which I previously did not know how to pronounce properly. Since unknown are platforms that you can fall through, that opens up a lot of very fast movement options that we can perform in rapid succession. I wish I could explain it. I wish I could explain this all at full speed, but I'll just let the gameplay do the talking for the next 20 seconds or so, and so we have time for a quick donation until there's about 40 seconds left on the clock. All right, we actually have a total of $45 donated from John Gabriel that says, Thanks for having me, Task Giving. Great runs and a great cause. Stay safe, everyone. And thank you for your donation. Thank you. And as we're about to see in one second, the other Pokemon will disappear. Squirtle pops back up, signifying the completion of the Poke Floats loop. So Fox will take a bow and we will quit out. And that hopefully proves to you that we have conquered Melee's highly variable input lag, including disc space reads and input pulling drift and are able to console verify some Super Smash Brothers Melee. Thank you very much. Back to oh, you, Ona. You know, for, <laughs> you guys in commentary might not be able to see my camera. Maybe you can. I was grinning the whole time. I will never get bored watching that, despite all the practices we had. That is so cool. Thank you so much for taking many hours to make that. Um, so before we show you the next uh, task, uh, Every task we're going to sort of bring up one issue. So the next issue we wanted to deal with was randomness, often referred to as RNG, which discusses the random number generator of the game. Uh, to be honest, we completely avoided dealing with it for now. So, uh, you know, certain runs that would involve computer behavior or, say, Peach's turnips, they wouldn't work yet. However, it's important to note that uh, community member Safe State actually made a tool that solved RNG. And I did see Safe State in chat earlier, so hello, Safe State. Um, he made a tool where humans can do this in real time, figure out what seed they're at, and actually figure out what it takes to advance to another given seed. So we really could have prepared a seed for you. There's just one problem. Um, there are 4.3 billion RNG seeds. We know how to advance at 4,800 per second. And so in the worst case, to get to a given RNG seed would take 10.3 days. And while Taskgiving likes us, I don't think they want to give us a 10.3 day estimate on our run to make sure we don't go over time. So we decided to ignore RNG for now. Uh, so RNG may come up. There is a 30% chance that the next run we show you will fail. But if not, we'll just run it again. No big deal. Uh, Rastery is going to go ahead and explain what our next run is. Take it away, Rastery. Sure. So um, this task is being performed in the home run contest mode, where you have to hit the sandbag as far as possible. Um, to achieve this, we first need to damage sandbag. Um, the best way to do this is by spamming Ganondorf's down aerial attack, which is the most powerful stomp in the game. 
Um, we increased the rate of this attack by doing a trick called ledge cancel. Uh, this reduces the 35 frame landing animation to just one frame by playing the teetering animation you get when falling off a ledge. Uh, normally each hit would send sandbag flying, but um, by dropping the bat on the first frame we can cancel this. Um, now, uh, once we get into the run, um, you'll see that um, each time we hit sandbag it lands randomly in either an I or a C shape. Um, and practical tasks had to meticulously plan all subsequent hits to be able to deal with either scenario. So yeah, as you can see, um, each down smash it ends up in either a elongated I shape or a curled, curled over C shape. Uh, and unfortunately, we cannot mitigate this for the final warlock punch because you punch it in the other direction backwards um, to get the strongest hitbox. Luckily, uh, this seems to have worked. <laughs> if it had landed in a I shape and we did the final punch, uh, it would fail. And there's a 30% chance of that happening. But uh, we didn't see it fail on the day, and that's great. But you see, um, uh, melee developers weren't expecting anyone to be able to damage Sandbag this much, so the stage runs out after 4,500 feet. The sandbag is still flying through the air off screen, it's just that the camera is locked at the furthest to the top right that it's allowed to go. After 10,000 feet you see the counter, the counter runs out, because obviously it's only got five digits, but it is still flying off screen, and after a while it'll drop below the level of the stage, since there's no floor after this point, so you can see the camera goes down. Eventually, uh, once it passes 16,000 feet, uh, an assert in the melee code base will fail. Uh, melee will throw an unhandled exception, and we've hard locked the game. Yay, we broke Yay, it! Yay, we broke it! Ah, awesome. <laughs> it's busted. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Um, uh, if we gave inputs right There's now. There's a reason we do this run last. Sorry, say again. There's a reason we do this run yeah. last. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we were to give it inputs now, it wouldn't even respond to start or anything. Uh, speaking of being the last run, um, I heard our donation incentive was met. Is that true? Yes, the donation incentive has been met. Awesome. So I guess this won't be the last run. Thank you very much for all of your donations, supporting NAMI, and allowing us to show you the next content. So um, this was added yesterday. <laughs> and I think with that, I will just uh, pass it over to Practical Task to reveal a new world record that he got late Friday evening and we synced on Saturday. Take it away. Yeah, I really wanted to bring something special to Task Giving. The Pikachu run you saw earlier was set back in April and it's already been published, unlisted, and shared around. But I thought to myself, what if I could premiere a brand new Task record live for all of you? And I cut it close, but on Friday night, I broke the 10-year-old Break the Target's task record for Fox and begged Ona to include it in the presentation. Traditionally, Fox's Break the Target's run, both RTA and TAS, is performed on the PAL version of Melee because Fox has a lower weight in PAL and therefore is sent farther when he gets damage boosted by a burner hazard. However, we're running on NTSC 1.0, so I plugged the same inputs into NTSC and found out that for this specific run, the gap between PAL and NTSC is small enough that both versions complete on the same frame, so we are able to premiere it here. This strategy was originally created by the legendary AJP Anton, who scored a 5.26, and I was able to optimize it with some very precise angles, ultimately saving two frames. Don't blink. Here we go. Ready, go! Woo. Awesome. Thus setting the new world record as of less than two days ago, and it is now published to 5.23 seconds. So that is pretty sweet. Um, thank you, everyone. I'd like to just take a moment to thank a, a few key players. There are a lot of people who were involved in this. Um, I'm gonna name sort of the major players. First, I want to thank uh, the Dolphin team who started working with us on this about a year and a half ago. In particular, Fled AU, JMC4789, and Use, who helped us um, line up the inputs, parse the replay files correctly. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank uh, Meta Construct, who uh, the, he sometimes goes by Meta, who helped us with uh, some of the Gecko codes for testing. We used various codes like Polefix. Uh, uh, the the uh, input clock drift fix uh, to um, help us while we were testing and planning on syncing the inputs. 
uh, Taocon or Tao, uh, who I also saw uh, in the chat. Uh, he is a technical melee engine guru, and he was just an absolute wealth of information about, you know, he helped us explain why, you know, why video might not sync, why audio might not sync, why rumble might not sync, and we're lucky it did uh, due to um, some interesting factors of the melee engine, all sorts of buffering and such. Uh, the MOS 3212. Uh, for all things Python, including the interpreter that interprets the Dolphin replay file, the DTM file. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Skippy, who provided, he mailed me to borrow his GameCube HDMI converter so that you would get a much better picture for uh, today's run. So um, without that, you would be getting kind of a broken composite video. So, um, yeah, uh, Twitch chat, did you like that? I'm hoping some of the Melee community is here. Press one if you enjoyed that. And, uh, and, wait, why is, why is my console back on? Did, did one of you do that? I mean, they have remote access. Why, this must be another secret task. <laughs> this secret task was made by Rasteri, and it is a slight modification of what you saw earlier. So, take it away, Rasteri. Tell us, what are we seeing Sirs. here? So, I'm not really, I'm not really a Tazer. Um, this is actually my first ever Taz, really. Um, but it's not a Taz in the traditional sense. It's uh, an interactive Taz, so to speak. So, um, yeah, if the uh, Twitch chat it's would like going. to uh, say a few things, uh, that would be absolutely great. Remember, <laughs> Twitch plays Pokemon. Yeah. Remember Pokemon <laughs> plays Twitch? Remember Discord plays Twitch? Everyone, welcome to Super Smash Bros. Melee plays Twitch. So because of how long it takes to enter all the data, it's not exactly a smooth experience, but um, you all can verify that Safe State did say Pog in chat, and then Task 9000 gave 25 pixels to that person. Um, so... <laughs> We can leave this running. When we were testing, Taz9000 uh, was a big star in helping us test, so thanks, Taz9000. Yes, we may have been lurking with this bot in this chat uh, for the last couple days to um, make sure it works. So it'll save this here for a bunch of seconds, and um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let it show one more, because uh, it looks like it captured my buddy Gravitos. Um, let's see what we got. Wow, Gravitos and Mango made it in. What would, it wouldn't be a melee uh, task without Mango. So let's just let this play one more. All right, Grav, you're famous. Mango's already famous. <laughs> Mango, Mango. All right, and uh, one more thing, uh, just as we say goodbye for real, I just want to say, um, you know, this this really was a blast working on this. Um, to get this working, um, Adawada got a computer for me that runs a dedicated Linux server that allowed um, Rasteri to do remote development on an NTSC console from the UK. We have uh, practical tasks from Canada, and we have myself and King Curb 64. I'm sorry, who's also Adawada, um, helping me uh, from from the states. And um, I'm just so happy this all came together, and we were able to show it to you. Um, stick around if you want to see more of me on commentary, because coming up next we have an SM64 drum run using the same hardware to get a drum set to somehow work on the Nintendo 64. And as you see on the screen, hashtag free melee, hashtag save smash. Thank you so much, everyone. That's the real end.